Okay, so despite Cyberpunk 2077's launch and all the issues that came with it, I still thoroughly enjoyed the game. My first playthrough was over 60 hours long, and my second playthrough that was just for fun was still around 40 hours, and that was me trying to rush my way through. Though, despite all of this, some players in the Cyberpunk community have managed to get their speedrun times under 3 hours, which is absolutely mind-blowing that players are able to take a game that is so long in narrative and have a lot of different aspects aspects to the game and condense it into something where you can just play through the game in one sitting. So despite this game only being a few months old at this point, maybe it's time we take a closer look at how Cyberpunk 2077 was completed at the time of recording this in just 2 hours, 52 minutes, and 1 second. Now jumping into things, Cyberpunk 2077 isn't just a play the game as quickly as you can type game to get it completed in a time under 3 hours. It's actually really interesting how speedrunners have to utilize several different tricks and exploits along the way to just cruise through this game. And for this run, we're going to be looking at the world record holder Cold Cypher, who's been speedrunning this game since the day that Cyberpunk 2077 released. And seriously, he helped us out so much with the outline and script for this video, really going into detail to make sure we're explaining things in the best way possible. So make sure you check out his links in the description down below. And he actually came up with a lot of some of these crazy strategies to course out how to quickly play through the game. Some of the tricks used here are things we've never seen in speedrunning before, and it's really impressive. Also, a quick shout out also to Lutz, who is another Cyberpunk 2077 speedrunner, who also formerly had the world record and helped us out a bit answering some of our questions too, so it's really cool to see how this community is really passionate about these runs. So jumping into the speedrun, the main setup for the game really is where a few variables are adjusted to optimize the run for the fastest speed possible. Starting things off, we see a jump onto easy difficulty with the Street Kid backstory, as out of the three life story options, the Nomad life story is the longest, which isn't very viable for speedrunning, and while Corporo is much faster, Street Kid can still be completed in the shortest amount of time. Also, speedrunners typically change their language to Polish for faster dialogue, and interestingly enough, with Cyberpunk 2077, the fact that this game wasn't fully optimized on launch for all types of systems, we saw this really unique issue with Cold Cypher, where when he started speedrunning, he was on older PC hardware, and since Cyberpunk 2077 had some frame rate issues, this would lead to a direct impact on speedruns over time. And what's really exciting is with the speedrun we're going to look at by Cold Cypher, this is after he upgraded his hardware, meaning now he can really get an awesome time while not having the game itself slugging away on older hardware being a hindrance to the overall time. Now, in creating the character, we see Cold Cypher put three points into the body category and three points into reflexes, with one point over in the technical ability. These choices mostly boil down to some specifics in the run, like having extra health or being able to brute force a door open, or have a different door open with a technical ability, and for a major trick that's used throughout the run, having the reflexes skill a little bit buffed does help with some tricks associated with that that we'll get into in a little bit. Also, in the setting, Cyberpunk allows players to skip full dialogue chunks and automatically go to the part where V responds, which is faster than using the default skip function, and you'll see this throughout the run. Fortunately enough, in the opening section, it's just a few speedy dialogue parts, some bunny hopping to keep momentum going, and an awkwardly silent car ride before a regular non-bunny hop walk through the car while talking on the phone since you can't get the same momentum while you're talking on the phone. See why Street Kid's really quick here? After completing in the intro sequence, players gain access to a bit more freedom with movement, and right away we see Cold Cypher begin to use several tricks that will be used throughout the whole run and also get some stuff set up for later on. For instance, right away when you're still with Jackie after the time skip, Cold Cypher uses a trick called Fist Gliding, which involves essentially equipping fists, then switching to a gun, then using the scroll on the mouse at the same time to set up a glide that is achieved when spamming the left mouse button, gaining momentum vertically in the air, or even horizontally while jumping. This ends up allowing V to do somewhat of this vertical climb right in the corner of the garage to clip upwards into the ceiling, and once at a specific point, Cypher then saves and reloads the game, which if done correctly, puts V upstairs outside of the map. This is a really good example of how this trick is used throughout the run to get into areas that can maybe speed along a process. But also from there, Cold Cypher moves to the elevator shaft and he 
uses the trick again to climb up to where the level will continue, bypassing all of the stuff that you typically have to do when playing through this level normally. Now what's really cool about this in this specific run though, is that doing this trick is very specific to how you're standing and what angle you're at, and it's one of the biggest reset points for Cold Cypher when he's speedrunning the game, just because it is very specific. It's not one of those tricks that's frame specific per se, but it is very important that the location is absolutely perfect or else you could clip outside of the building or not get the clip at all right and lose all of the time. Now in the next part of the mission, he moves forward looting specific items and punches and shoots enemies in a pretty calculated order, but they drop with no problem. This is to preserve stamina in the best way possible. And then after dropping Sandra off, there is a required car ride with V that you can't skip until the back half of the ride. And in some speed runs, you might notice players staring at the floor or at the ceiling. This is actually to prevent frame drops while riding in a vehicle. However, now that Cold Cypher has a beastly computer, he doesn't have to worry about that here. After completing the prologue, one of the biggest strategies that is used in a speedrun is set up. This is a trick known as K-hopping in the cyberpunk speedrunning community and involves players acquiring something called a Kerenzikov nervous system from a ripper dock. Now, once that's acquired, V is able to slow down time. And if the player utilizes this ability while timing a lunge with the slowdown ability at the same time to gain a ton of momentum and just speed along. It's actually really hilarious at times, but also super effective in maneuvering. Now the main issue and the reason most casual players don't pick up the Karenzikov nervous system is that it costs 5,000 euro dollars, which typically players don't have access to early on in the game. However, Cold Cypher utilized a duplication glitch at the machine right by the apartment. By spamming the R and escape button, the game forgets the item in the inventory was already sold and it can be sold again and again. This allows speedrunners to straight up empty out the balance on the ATM if they choose, which gives them the funds needed to get the additional upgrade with Vic. However, before we can get this upgrade, Cold Cypher still has to make his way over to Vic and instead of just using a normal way of transportation to get to V's office quickly, Cypher opts for a faster fist glide up the interior of the building outside of the typical playable area and then does a precise slide off of the ledge allowing V to continue his slide jump when he lands without having to take severe fall damage. This can be tricky though and heartbreaking at times if you're going at a good pace and end up getting stuck or something. That was actually super good then the clicking. I didn't think I was that fast. No, 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 no. From there at the ground level, you can actually meet up with Jackie by fist gliding over to him. And when it's time to head over to Vic, fist glide your way over obstacles and keep that forward momentum going no matter how chaotic it can get. But definitely keeping that forward momentum is key for cruising over to Vic fast. Matter of fact, this is the main form of transportation tied with some of those K hops later on that we'll get into, which makes it so V doesn't even need a driver's license. He literally just glides, flies, and hops his way everywhere across Night City. But boom, after you meet up with Vic, you're really set up for the future. Now the rest of Act 1 typically consists of meeting up with Dex, maybe working alongside Meredith Strout and the whole all food stuff culminating into the big heist in Compeki Plaza. However, Cold Cypher just ignores the Meredith side of things altogether. And after getting the upgrades from Vic, we see another trick used to save time and keep things moving along. Now throughout Cyberpunk 2077, phone calls sometimes just come in and will block some of the advanced movement used for speedrunning. However, some of the time a speedrunner can actually predict the phone calls that will happen and by killing a non-playable character, it'll end up forcing the game to cancel the call and allow the movement tricks to still be performed. For example, when you're riding with Dex, right after you get out of the car, there's a chance that this guy will spawn there and Cypher actually relies on the guy spawning there or else a lot of time ends up getting lost waiting for Regina just to stop talking. Now the phone calls are persistent and maybe as annoying as a stereotypical tech scammer and V will have to answer them at some point. However, if Cold Cypher waits to start taking calls once he gets to a little curb on the road here, Cypher can do a little trick where running alongside the curve moves V at this super speed, it becomes the perfect opportunity to catch up on some of those phone calls. 
Now this little curb or rail running trick is something you may have experienced in your own playthrough, but for whatever reason, if V is running on a very narrow platform, curb, or railing, he just cruises really quickly. So since V isn't needed to do some jumps or K hops here, it's a great time to catch up on all those phone calls and it even glitches out a little bit, showing multiple characters talking at once. Now there's one more trick that can be utilized with the All Foods Meetup, but essentially by utilizing the fast travel locations, speedrunners are able to pull off a really easy glitch that allows for players to store a fast travel in their inventory so that they can activate the fast travel at any point. But essentially, much like the duplication glitch, using left mouse button and escape, you can trick the game into thinking that V is still in the user interface for fast traveling and essentially store the fast travel teleportation in your inventory to be called upon at any point. For instance, after you make, or in this case, don't make the deal with Royce, you usually have to shoot your way out of the building altogether. But instead, as soon as Cypher makes his way out of combat after clearing out that first room, he can just open his map, use that saved fast travel to go right back to the outside of All Foods again, and then travel back inside just enough, which causes the game to think he's moved up through the level. Jackie will catch up, and essentially a decent portion of this section in the game is just bypassed. Now, interestingly enough, where Regina's phone calls earlier were annoying, she comes in handy here where Cypher uses a trick to speed up non-playable characters who usually you're stuck waiting around for to chat, walk, take a breather, whatever they end up doing. We see this right away at the end of this level where you talk to Jackie before fully completing the level, but if you call Regina and skip her dialogue, it actually speeds Jackie up along as well. So being friends with Regina can have its perks. This is a trick we'll see occasionally throughout the run just to kind of keep these things moving along. After flying across Night City to Lizzie's bar, there's a lot of dialogue here to skip through when you're meeting up with Evelyn. When you finally agree to meet up with Judy for brain dance training, you're supposed to follow Evelyn along, though she walks incredibly slow. Trying to get in front of Evelyn does help move things along slightly faster, but sheesh, is she slow. After Lizzie's bar, it's just a quick saved fast travel to the afterlife to meet with Dex and Jackie, and next thing you know, you're on your way to that big ol' Kenpeki Plaza heist. You progress through the early part of this level pretty much the same way you would expect. Jackie is really slow when going through the lobby, but much like the phone call trick, by talking to the bartender, you can accelerate everything and get Jackie to rush into the elevator so you don't have to wait as long. And while the next half of the speed run of this game is incredibly interesting with some really crazy tricks just brought to the maximum level, the early part of the hotel, you're kind of stuck doing things that don't really have a lot of time saves. However, it is impressive to see some precision aiming done, which does allow for the flathead drone to move along a little bit quicker, skip some scans, and just press through this part a little bit sooner than you would if you played it more normally. Up in Yorinobo's office, running over and grabbing the gun by the bed is incredibly helpful, especially since this gun is slightly better than the gun that you typically have, and also you don't have your gun going into Compeki Plaza, so using this gun on the way out is a good tool to have. Now I do have to say the whole section of hiding inside of the screen and just skipping through all of the cutscene and dialogue stuff is kind of funny to look at. I mean, just so much important groundbreaking and earth shattering plot stuff is going on here and it's just cruising right through. Matter of fact, Cypher actually moves faster than the dialogue can even keep up before he ends up dropping down, though it is really interesting how quickly he's cleared through this place. Running out of the building though can be a little tense, just kind of fighting your way past everything. You have to hope that Jack he is hurrying up because he can be a huge time loss since a lot of time you just sit around and wait for him. During the Delamain escape, we see Cypher shooting down the drones ASAP or one of them will end up flying behind the building, causing a pretty big time loss for the driving section because once those drones are out of the way, you can progress on faster. And then from there, right after meeting up with your BFF Dex, we go into the Johnny Silverhand flashback. At the beginning, helicopters circle around multiple times, but if you're quick enough, you can pull off a Johnny One Cycle, which is where you clear all the required enemies fast enough for the helicopter to not have to cycle around again. Which then means Johnny can actually get out of the helicopter faster, which is super hype if a runner can manage to pull this off. From there, cruising through the flashback section in Arasaka Tower is pretty fast paced and having level familiarity with where the enemies are going to be and pop off the shots where you have to. as. 
Johnny is really good for cruising on through this section. Now, starting things off on Act 2, there's definitely a lot of things that kind of pick up plot-wise at the very beginning, and there's a lot of meeting up and talking sections you kind of have to go through first. Fortunately, Cold Cypher just flings his way through all of those sections pretty quickly, leading up to the section where V gets to the clouds. Now, interestingly enough, there's a lot of different ways typically to play through this level, but it seems like the main strategy is just to fly right through it and get that katana and go straight to that weird creepy dude. Seriously though, getting that katana is so cool. It's just, just such a good katana. From there, you go to the section where typically you have to go and interrogate fingers. Honestly, the best way to do this is just rip the door right open. Don't worry about cutting in line and go interrogate fingers at your own pace. You can quickly buy a brain dance and just loot it off of him. From there, you have to do some required brain dance stuff. And honestly, the fastest way to get through these is just having precise scanning to speed the brain dances along and knowing exactly ahead of time what you need to scan and at what point. Cypher uses a lot of the tricks that he's been using so far, like doing katana lunges and whatnot, to rush his way through the next section, saving Evelyn, dropping her off with Judy, and then just going over to talk to Rogue because she's kind of the next important thing to move the story along. Rogue then introduces you to Pan Am, and long story short, you have to go with Pan Am to help get her truck back. Now, typically, there's a bunch of enemies around, you have to sneak around, get the keys, snag the car, and drive off, but instead, we just see this really deadly launch directly to the truck, taking out the person with the keys, and then just grabbing the truck and driving off. There are quite a few sections where you have to just sit around and ride around with Pan Am, and she wants you to go and help her get some revenge somewhere, but if you just say no, you can skip that whole thing. Matter of fact, just in general, there's a lot of riding around with Pan Am that just takes a long time. However, later on, after you EMP the transport with Pan Am, you have to get rid of some of the drones, which finally moves Pan Am's part of the storyline along a bit. We then see Cold Cypher do a really cool trick here called a Mitch Skip, where typically you would get out of the car, you'd run over there, disable the turret, and do this big encounter to rescue Mitch. But by timing out some slides and bypassing the guards, you can actually skip this whole section and go straight to the building where they're keeping Hellman. This trick is really cool, and it saves a little over a minute of time. Now essentially, Cold Cypher does something really awesome when he's approaching the part where he goes to get Hellman. Essentially, he combines K-Hops with some really sneaky skills to get right up to Hellman without being noticed along the way. Now there is obviously some level of RNG involved here, but just the fact that this sequence of tricks is used and then it's pulled off is so incredibly awesome. And as we start to close into the last required arc of the game, there are just a few tricks that come up here in the end section that will completely make or break a speedrun. And some of these tricks are so incredibly awesome to see how they're pulled off and how they actually end up playing a major role to the overall time that a cyberpunk run can get into. And one of these is a really interesting part when you're with the Voodoo Boys. After you set up some stuff for the big heist with Takamira, you have to head over to Pacifica and do some stuff with the Voodoo Boys. But what's really interesting here is typically you have to go into the big abandoned mall turned gym. And this is where a really impressive trick called the gym skip is required to get an optimum time here. We see Cold Cypher set up a quick fast travel store, and once you enter the building, there's typically a ton of enemies, and the goal here is to sneak past all of them completely undetected to skip the boss fight with the Sasquatch at the end section before you get into the movie theater where you find the agent. But if you take on a very specific angle, you can get a perfect K-hop slide so the guards in the gym don't detect you. Now this part is tricky and sometimes it requires a few resets, but it's worth the time save just because you don't want to have to deal with fighting against Sasquatch. If you mess up, it's easier just to reload and save. If this trick can be pulled off though, going straight up the theater and just taking out the agent right away is the fastest way to deal with it. We then see Cold Cypher push through the next sections with the Voodoo Boys, going into the flashback section with Johnny Silverhand once again. And for the most part, the strategy here is just to know where all the enemies are and quickly clear them out. In the first area, you have to be extra careful not to go too fast or else the game can softlock, which actually happened to me in my original playthrough of Cyberpunk 2077. But yeah, for the most part, for the second flashback section with Johnny Silverhand, just knowing where the enemies are is the fastest way to cruise past it. But after everything that's gone through the entire speedrun for Cyberpunk 2077, it all culminates up to the 
final trick that is extremely nerve-wracking because it's easy to mess up and plays a pretty big role in the outcome of the final speedrun time. Not only does the parade have a lot of different elements that can get in the way and cause issues in the speedrun, but it also has a boss fight at the very end. So typically on the parade level, you just have to make your way through the crowd and take out the various snipers, making your way over to their netrunner and then clear the level. It's a pretty lengthy level typically, however, the way that this is approached in a speed running format is very unique. Right off the bat, the crowd RNG plays a major role as V has to be able to navigate through the crowd as quickly and efficiently, and it can be different each run. Fortunately enough, Cold Cypher got a really good role with the crowd here starting things off. No random people just blocking V's way there. Moving up to take out the first snipers, going for headshots is the main strategy to quickly take them out without too much of an issue. Then Cold Cypher quickly turns around and K-Hop jumps across the building over to the building on the other side of the street to save time having to traverse and finding the bridge location, quickly picks off the next sniper, but then the epic moment that will completely decide the outcome of this trick and the overall run in this case, which is where V typically has to travel to the upper levels of where the parade is going on, and instead of going through the next sections, fighting against several enemies, and finding elevators along the way, we see Cold Cypher pull off one of the most impressive fist flights that we've seen in the entire run. And honestly, this last section is just an epic culmination of a lot of the tricks that were required to master along the way, all coming together to decide the outcome of this individual level. Once he pulls the fist flight up onto the balcony, he does a quick K-hop across from that balcony over a massive gap to land over on this bridge. And honestly, the hype that Cold Cypher had when he pulled it off on his first attempt during the run that ended up being the world record was so awesome to see. No, he's, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. He's locked on, he's locked on. I don't know if we'll survive this. Yes! Oh my God, yes! Okay. We're past all the scary stuff. He quickly takes out the enemies in the area, pushes into the elevator, and starts upgrading some stuff to make his sword and blade usage more effective during the boss fight with Oda. He then goes into the boss fight with Oda with his legendary katana and traps Oda in a corner where he won't typically run off and start making it this weird chase with the boss that can take more time. And with the end of the run in sight, it's just a matter of having a few things come together to finalize and lock in that world record time. Cold Cypher has to exit the level as per normal. He does get a fast travel set up and saved at Arasaka Tower, which plays a massive role in just a few moments, and then heads over to where Takamura is, and he makes sure to knock on the door four times. After this section, he has to make a quick escape through the building, just running past all of the enemies, and then all of a sudden, he wakes up with Johnny in a motel outside of the city. After quickly talking to the doll and the doll leaves, we see Cold Cypher activate that fast travel point to Arasaka Tower, which completely skips over the tapeworm level where you typically talk to Johnny inside of the motel room in Pacifica, and he heads straight into Embers starting the end game point of no return. Now typically at this point in the game you have various options as to which ending you want to take based off of what relationships and side quests you did along the way. However, since there weren't any side quests or anything like that, the options are pretty limited, though one ending option is obviously much faster than all of the other endings in Cyberpunk 2077, which of course is the one that ends up being chosen here because it abruptly ends the game. And while it might be one of the more anticlimactic endings to Cyberpunk 2077, it sure is the fastest and picking the option just to end it all does end the speed run. And this is how we ended up seeing Hold Cypher pull off an impressive speed run time with two hours, 52 minutes and one second. Seriously, seeing a run like this done where an entire game that is intended to take over 60 hours or more to play through is condensed to just a couple of hours is so incredibly impressive. And if you want to watch Cold Cypher's run, it actually is really interesting to see. He did commentary throughout his run, and you can also watch him when he live streams it. So make sure you check out his channel in the description down below, especially because he helped us really take on figuring out the specifics of this run. But if you enjoyed this video, make sure you are subscribed with notifications for more speedrunning content just like this, or you can join the conversation on our Discord, link in the description.